We're going, okay, y'all turn to Romans 6. <clears throat> Why y'all turn in there? But anybody watching, if you've sent me anything in the mail in the last couple weeks and I hadn't said anything about getting it or something, let me know because um, apparently we something's going on with our mail. So I had Pam sent me a little package and uh, it never came and uh, somebody else sent and I ain't got my water bill. So apparently we're having some trouble with our mail. But anyway, also if you emailed me in the last few days and I hadn't got back, I will. We had a lightning storm that got our motor, but I've got it going again. I'm just behind on that. Alright, Romans 6, let's read uh, verse 23. It says, everybody knows this verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we've all heard this, one of the most famous, most used passages, right? <clears throat> let's take a look at it and let's see if we can break it down and see if we can get past just the surface understanding that we generally hear about it. What generally this verse is used for is to say something along these lines. If you sin, the result is God's going to cast you in hell. Now basically that's what people say. The wages of sin is death, right? Sinners go to hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's preached in a salvation message to say that if you'll turn from your sins and on and on. Now, I'm not telling you that, that you can't preach salvation from this verse. What I'm telling you is I want you to just notice something. It says the wages of sin is. What tense is is? Did he say the wages of sin will ultimately be death in the future? Did he say the wages for sin will finally result in your death? He didn't say that, did he? He said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is. Now again, is is present tense. Mm -hmm. it? Is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I believe that there's a whole lot more in the passage than we really, you know, take take notice of, I guess I should say. First off, the word wage, it's it's basically, it means like the in, in a Roman army, they didn't pay them money, they gave them their rations, their food for that day, okay? So the wage was what they paid them to sustain them for the day, it was their rations, okay? So it says, the wages, the payment, the rations of sin is death. All right. <clears throat> If a person does not have the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for their sins, and every day they are trying to pay for their sin, do they have any peace of mind? Okay. What is every day of their life going to be like while they're trying to overcome sin? Fearful. It's going to be fearful, failure, right, every day. Now, we're going to look at a whole, whole bunch of different aspects of this. Okay. So I've got the person, say in Paul's day, the Jew. And the Jew had lived under the law, right? And the law pointed out sin. So every day of the Jew's life, did the Jew ever have peace of mind about his eternal security or was he scared every day because of his sin? So by living under the law, which in turn is living under the penalty of sin, that person every day had a result. They had a frame of mind and it was always death, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Now look, under Moses' law, every day was death. I mean, seriously, every day they failed under the law and every day at the temple, what happened? They had sacrifices. They had sacrifices. It was constant death, mm -hmm. wasn't it? So then that person's frame of mind was never hope. It was never positive. It was never power to overcome. It was never victory. It was always defeat. Mm -hmm. Alright, if you come on this side of the cross, as long as I live under the Christian law of righteousness for quit, re repent of your sin and you can be saved or do this or quit doing that and you can be saved. Every day I try and do that and every day I fail, therefore every day what type of mindset do I have? I live in failure. So the wages, the daily payment, daily rations, what you can expect, what you have earned, the wages of sin is death. Every single day, that's what it is, isn't it? He says, but the gift of God is every day eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, what happens when a person gets saved? First thing, what's that? All right, I got somebody over here, and this person has lived all their life under the burden of sin, right? The day that they get saved, what happens to the sin? It falls away. The burden, it don't mean that, that Jesus dies for their sin that day. In their mind, the truth shines through and through and the burden of their sin rolls away, right? And what is added to them at that same time? Peace. Peace, Peace through 
righteousness, right? So then this person has now had a change of mind. And I don't even mean like repentance. I mean literally a change of thinking. All of a sudden, this person has got a hope. Now, they've got a peace that comes over them about their sin, but that's just the, the, the past tense salvation right there, right? What about every day the way they live their life? How should this person live every day of their life? Like the person's got hope. This person ought to live every day of their life. Look, I'm not talking about some overcoming sin in the flesh and sinless perfection. I'm talking about somebody that's not downtrodden about the things going on around them. I'm talking about somebody that even though they're suffering the persecutions and the tribulations of this world, they never get depressed about it because they've always got a better hope, don't they? Mm -hmm. So then every day, this person doesn't live under the mindset of death, destruction, failure. This person lives under the mindset of Christ is in me. If, I, if God be for me, who can be against me, right? Mm -hmm. This person can go on living his life knowing, hey, if God's got something for me to do, I can do it. Yes. Not because I'm special, because God's going to do it through me. Yes. So this person has got this peace. Now, go over real quick just to look at how this... this remember in the context he's comparing serving under the law and its dominion and, and not serving under the law. For instance, go to uh, chapter 7, verse 5. He says, for when we were in the flesh... Now, Paul was still in a fleshly body, wasn't he? But he had been saved. He's no longer in the flesh, so to speak, uh, in terms of standing with God. He said, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, the emotions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Alright, as long as I'm trying to produce fruit under the law. Right? Here's the Jew who tried to produce righteousness under the law, right? He's working to produce righteousness. Did he ever get it done? No. no. Then rather than producing righteousness as his fruit, what was his fruit every day? Yeah. It was death. It's sin. This person every day, their works fall short of the complete righteousness of God's law. So every day this person goes to bed, not with a good frame of mind. This person goes to bed scared to death, don't they? I know I'm not the only one in here that went through this most of my life. Did anybody here ever lay your head on bed at night and think, man, if I die tonight, I'm in trouble. I mean, I did this today and that today, and, and I don't want to do it tomorrow, but odds are I will do it tomorrow. So then every day I'm living that, in that condemnation, right? Mm -hmm. Then I come on this side of the cross, and I've got the person who has been working in religion all their life, and no matter what the religion works are, no matter what their prescription for sin is, this person also goes to bed every night, and what is the result of all their labor? It's nothing. It's failure and sin. Nothing. It produces nothing. It's, it's useless, right? So in order for this person to trust the finished work of Christ, this person is going to have to quit working their own righteousness, aren't they? Okay, now he says here that in verse 5, when they were under the sin, all their fruit that came forth was just unto death, wasn't it? Anybody in here ever do anything in your flesh before salvation that you can expect to get something at the judgment seat of Christ for? Mm -hmm. Nothing. I don't care how holy or righteous it appeared to your neighbors. If you weren't saved, you weren't hired by God yet, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody like Seinfeld? Mm -hmm. Y'all ever seen the Seinfeld where Kramer just started going to work at that place? They never hired him. Yeah, he just yeah, started going to work, right? Mm -hmm. And he started carrying his briefcase and all that. And finally it got down. He turned in a report. And the guy looked at it. He said, this is like you don't even work here. And he's like, well, he goes, who hired you? And it come to find out he's been working at a place and nobody ever hired him. Did they owe him any pay? No. Can the lost person do anything in the Lord? No. no. So then the first thing that's got to happen is this person's going to have to be saved, right? Now go over to 1 Timothy. Chapter 2. <clears throat> we, we always talk a lot of times about things that happened in the past and how they played out in the book of Acts and how they might play out in the future, but I really need to try and spend, begin spending more time on right now, today. Okay, now watch what he says here in 1 Timothy 2 3. He says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will, so it's God's will, who will have all men to be saved 
That's got to come first, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But then he says, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, amongst the, the people that, I, that I've come up the last few years around, this knowledge of the truth thing has taken on a real perversion, in my opinion. I was taught and, and believed it and taught it that, yeah, you get saved and now you need to get to work learning the proper doctrine in the Word of God. And while that's true, that falls short of what the verse is actually saying. Hey, first off, to come unto the knowledge of the truth. If this is just doctrinal knowledge, in other words, uh, theology, right? I'm going to get saved and then I'm going to learn the Word of God better than anybody. Does that sound like that, no that ain't getting it done? Is it? Okay, I'm going to show you all the counterpart of that thinking. Go over to 1 Corinthians. Now, we always knock the Jew for requiring a sign because we can see that requiring a sign is not faith. It? That's pretty simple, right? If you require a sign, then you don't believe God by faith. Does everybody agree with that? Well, look at the other half of the verse. In 22, he says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Well, well 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Now, we always talk about the Jew requires a sign, but I generally leave off the Greek seeks after wisdom. What does the Gentile, in general, over here, think it's all about after they're saved? Works. Work wisdom. They can understand it. Understand the Scripture. Right. Some say, well, you've got to learn how to divide it. You've got to learn this. You've got to memorize that. In other words, they put the highest order on just individual learning, don't they? You know, that ain't coming under the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. It ain't, folks. You, you can just be a theologian above all theologians and never understand the things God would have you understand. Now, let's go look at some of these things. First, let's look at this word knowledge. I want to show you the exact same word. This is not a head knowledge. It's not an intelligence. It's not that kind of thing. Go to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to show you the same word. Colossians 2 uh, verse 1. Paul writing to the Colossians tells them, for I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that, here's what Paul's, he's what he's hoping for, praying for them, that their hearts might be comforted. What, what's another word for comforted? Peace. 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 What's the opposite of comfort? Yeah. Discomfort or un... What is it? What's that? Huh? Torment. Torment, tribulation, right? All right. A person that has peace of mind, even though they might be going through troubling situations, are they distressed about them beyond? Do they do they peril? Do they no? They don't go off the deep end. Their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all the riches of the full assurance. Now, what does assurance mean? Guarantee. Guarantee. The full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Y'all see acknowledgement? Mm -hmm. That's the same word as knowledge. To come unto the knowledge of the truth is not just to gain a grasp of what the words say in the book. It's to come unto a literal, physical, uh, how we say, on-the-job training. Yeah. Hey, me and Chris was talking when he first got here. He said he was on the boat and said, these guys would go to these maritime schools and get them a third class engineer or whatever and come on the boat and didn't know nothing. They couldn't do anything. What did it take, Chris, for them to actually know how to do the job? Hands on. Hands on. It took some time on the job, didn't mm -hmm. it? He, when I was on the submarine, we'd have these... Uh, when I first, uh, On a submarine, you don't have that many people. So each person has to do several jobs. And you find out on a submarine, it's a little different than the rest of the Navy. The, the hierarchy ain't exactly officers and then you come to find out it's the people that are the best at their jobs get the most respect and they get the leeway and they, you know what I mean? They, they're look, well, when I very first got there, the first day I walk in, I'm standing in the sonar shack and in walks this new lieutenant. He went to MIT. I know that because every time he ever introduced himself, he lets you know he went to MIT. <laughs> he walked in and he said, okay, what are we doing for field day to day? That means cleaning. Now, the officers didn't clean. And some old sonarman, old first class enlisted guy, turned around and called this man stuff I hadn't heard. I mean, 
I couldn't believe he was talking to an officer that way. And he told him, get out of this shack and don't ever come back in here. Well, I thought, hey, this guy's going to captain's mess. Y'all know what? Nobody ever said a word to him. Never said a word. Later on, I got to talk and I asked another guy, I said, how did that guy, his name was Don LaRock. I said, how did he just talk to that officer that way? He said, buddy, LaRock's got some time on the pond. That's an old saying for he's, he knows, right? Mm -hmm. He said, this, this unit, this shack, this, it won't run without him. Now, not only did this guy know that, now I knew it, LaRock knew it, but somebody else knew it. The captain knew it. Mm -hmm. So then all that paper learning, all that book learning, didn't qualify that guy to do anything. This old ignorant first class knew what he was doing because he had actually done it and experienced it, right? Mm -hmm. he, I went to do something one time. He said, if you do that, it's going to electrocute you. And I said, no, it won't. He said, okay. I reached in there and it electrocuted me. <laughs> I said, how'd you know that? He said, because it electrocuted me about 10 years ago. <laughs> he, he had been there. He had done it, right? After a person gets saved, God doesn't take that person off this earth, dude, does he? What does that person begin to do then? I'm going to put O-J-T. Come to the knowledge or the acknowledging of the truth. All right, if we come back in the Old Testament, we've got an example back here. I mean, it's a perfect example. Matter of fact, according to Paul, it's a pattern or a type for the church. Did God deliver Israel out of Egypt? Mm -hmm. right? Blood was shed to get them out of there. Same as blood was shed at the cross. Then they were all baptized into one body, weren't they? Body mm -hmm. of Moses. Same as we've got to be identified into the body of Christ. But after they come out of the Red Sea, did God bring them straight to the promised land? Three days. They could have cut right across there and been there in just a few days. Mm -hmm. Instead, what did God, where did He do with them? He brought them somewhere. He brought them in the wilderness. And what was God's desire out there in the wilderness for this group of people that had become His people? To believe in Him. To believe in Him and to trust, trust Him. What was God showing them every single day about Himself? He'd take care of them. He'd take care of them. Folks, not only could He take care of them, He loved them. He could be everything they needed. If they needed bread, who did they look to? God. God. If they needed water, look to who? God. When they had to fight a, a battle, look to who? God. So was God trying to show them back there exactly what He was by His name? Yep. And remember what His name means. What's it mean? I am. I am what? Whatever it is you need, you look to me. Right? Come over here. What do you think the Lord Jesus Christ would have you and I, the risen Lord, would have you and I learn in this life after salvation today? Trust Him for everything. Trust in Him. If you need it, I provide it. That's right. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's peace of mind on a daily basis. Where does it come from? It comes from the Lord. I don't care if it's the ability to get up and go somewhere and, and preach. I don't care if it's the, to talk to my neighbor. Look, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's anything I'm going through in this life. If I need it, who do I look to? The Lord. Look to the Lord. How about a new Mercedes? <laughs> See, there. Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right, we're going to tell you what. We're going to flip this around real quick. Y'all go back to Ephesians because Chris brought up a good point. Ephesians 1. <clears throat> Alright, what type of life did the verse where we start say the saved person has what type of life? Eternal, right? Okay. Now, what is every single thing that I'm looking at on this earth? Temporal. Temporal. It's temporary, right? Then is there any way that I can take any of that into eternity with me? Okay, now, in Ephesians 1, verse 3, this gets misused in a big way. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, what this basically is saying, and we're going to go on to read it, or have you and I been made partakers of every single spiritual blessing of the new covenant? Mm -hmm. 
Every blessing God promised Abraham under that covenant, does it become ours? What people make this verse to say is this. The only thing you and I are supposed to pray for are physical or spiritual things. You don't ever pray for anything physical. Anybody ever heard that kind of thing? There's, there's, it's a very popular teaching today, and it's basically they teach like God has gone into retirement, and don't bother God, he, He's not doing those things today, they say. Okay. Now, if the verse is telling you and I that we only need to pray right, for spiritual things, somebody please read all the verses that Paul uses the word pray, and watch what Paul's praying for. Did Paul pray to get out of prison? Yeah. Did Paul pray for the sick people? Did Paul pray for doors to be open? Did Paul pray for daily sustenance? Did Paul tell us to pray for all things? Think about how damaging it is to come unto the knowledge or the acknowledging of the truth. What we need to acknowledge about the Lord Jesus Christ is His very nature. Acknowledge His... Uh, how would we say that? I'll just put supply. How about that? Okay. Now... If I teach you that God does not meet your supply today, how in the world are you ever going to come to know the Lord and who He is? You see what I mean? What they basically say is, we're, we're in the dispensation of grace, and there are no physical things that apply to me. <coughs> Seriously, this is a, a common teaching. Now, Chris brought up a new Mercedes. Alright, let's take a look at it. <clears throat> Anytime you want to... Uh, Take something, and if you're uncertain about it, take it, the premise, and push the premise as far over as you can. Maintain the premise, but just push it over till you can see the absurdity of it. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? All right? A lady, a friend that I have told, told me one day, I'd come up and I had a, a, in, in a car, a new car. I, my truck, I put a bunch of miles on it, started having some trouble, and got a new car, right? She said, you got a new car. And I said, yeah. She said, where'd you get that? I said, you know, a, a, a guy, a good friend in Montgomery, we went up one night and gave me, he said, here. He, they got the Hyundai up there and he gave me the keys. All right. She said, yeah, that's that blessing of a car. And I said, well, you're right about that. And I just left it at that. The next time I saw her, she said, oh, there you are in that blessed car. And I said, I want to talk to you about that. Now, do I believe that that car is a blessing? Yeah. Folks, I needed that car to get where I was going to do that job, right? Mm -hmm. But is that car going to go into eternity with me? No. <laughs> then is that car a reward or is that car a means to an end? Means to an end. All right. Do I believe that the Lord fixed it where I'd have... Yeah, I do. Folks, I put 300,000 miles on that little truck and me and Lexi never once broke down in the middle of the night anywhere. As soon as it started to give me a little bit of trouble, I didn't even say anything. This guy just gave me the keys of the car. Mm -hmm. My first instinct was, I can't do that. And then I got to thinking, you idiot. You, you know? So, okay. <laughs> do I believe that car is God meeting this, the yep. need? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do I believe that that car is the end product? Mm -hmm. No. Right. Folks, if you think that God's blessing of you is going to be just in these things that we want in this life, you're not thinking eternally, are you? Now, now go over to Colossians, chapter 3. How about a BMW then? <laughs> Lexi got a BMW from a guy that I thought was a friend and robbed us blind on it. <laughs> Lied, told me all this stuff about we got it home, it leaks water and it had been wrecked, water pours in all the time. Said, never, it just... But it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get one, that'd be my advice. Don't get one. <laughs> All right, now in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ. Now that's not physically, is it? Mm -hmm. Spiritually, if you've been identified with Christ, then where is your eternal home at? Mm -hmm. It's with Christ. So then where do you expect to spend eternity at? With Christ. How are you going to bring a BMW with you? Mm -hmm. All right, so he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Okay? People today pray, and they say that they need a blessing, and they think the blessing is the new car. Right? I once asked a guy if he was saved, and y'all know what he told me? 
got me a Hummer. He told me how he got a Hummer. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> now, the guy got a Hummer, okay? Hummer, that's a nice vehicle. I said, what's the payment on it? It was, I, man, it was astronomical. I said, well, that don't sound like a blessing to me. That sounds like a curse every month, doesn't it? That man thinks that that vehicle is proof that he's God's person, right? Mm -hmm. Do y'all reckon that that man is going to be able to take that vehicle past the grave? Mm -hmm. What kind of blessing is that? That ain't much of a God, is it? No. It ain't much of a God that will only bless us with physical things today. Now... You and I would appear in this lifetime at times not to be getting physical blessings because the world has a lot of tribulation and suffering that comes along with it, doesn't it? But Romans 8.28 says, For we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That doesn't mean, look at the vehicle I got. I got that because God loves me and everything's coming up daisies. Paul is talking about suffering and being a son of God. He said God was allowing him to go through some things that weren't pleasant, but guess what? It was for his own good. Now, not only was it for his own good in this lifetime to, to train him and teach him and harden him up and prepare him, but will it produce rewards at the judgment seat of Christ? Yeah. So then by allowing Paul to go through those things and by giving him the strength to endure them, the grace to get through them, never said he'd give him the grace to get him out of them, said he'd give him the grace to endure it, right? By allowing him to endure that, did God do Paul a good thing? Yeah. At the judgment seat, do you suppose Paul's going to say to the Lord, how could you leave me shipwrecked all night? No, no folks. I, I, the only analogy I know how to use is when I was in high school, at the start football practice in the fall, and before school starts, it's still hot, you have to go, and it's called two-a-days, you practice two times a day, right? Well, you've been doing nothing but drinking and chasing women, and all of a sudden, you're running bleachers. Well, what's everybody doing out there? Puking, out there puking, right? Everybody's throwing up and hacking, and I had a friend, his mom was at practice, she come running out there and told that coach, that's inhumane, how dare you, not my boy, and got him out of there, and what? Well, the rest of us went through. Mm -hmm. All right? Why was that coach putting us through that? Pay off in the long run. Pay off in the long run. There, that's the way to say it. In other words, even though that hurt at the time, and it might have seemed cruel at the time, it didn't kill us, did it? Mm -hmm. Did it prepare us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. As Paul was going through the things he went through, do you know what he said about all his trials and tribulations? It put him in a position to be able to comfort those around him. Okay? It also did something else. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and watch what God was doing with Paul. Now remember, we're talking about coming unto the knowledge of the truth, the acknowledging of something about truth. <clears throat> Paul says, uh, verse, uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. As Paul was suffering, who was also consoling him? Then is the Lord able to console? Yeah. yeah. Is that one of the things you and I can learn about the Lord in this lifetime? Yeah. He says, verse 6, Whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast. Knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, you shall be also of the consolation. In other words, Paul said, I know that while you're suffering, you also be consoled of the Lord and you also be trained to console others, right? Mm -hmm. He says, verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. He y'all ever heard the phrase, tough love? Mm -hmm. Y'all know today so many people want to be their kid's friend, you know what I mean, and be cool mom and all mm -hmm. that. Are they doing that kid a favor? Mm -hmm. I always use the example of American Idol. When they first come on, I used to like to watch it when that guy Simon was on it, right? Yeah. The very best ones to watch were the first couple shows before they got the good singers on. They had all these people coming in that couldn't sing a lick. It was good to watch. Y'all remember those? Yeah. And they had a guy come on there one time and you could watch him backstage. His mom and his grandma was there, no dad. Mom and grandma there, and they're telling him he's great. Oh, honey, you're the best. You just, you, you know, like uh, that Eddie Murphy. Man. Hurt, please, hurt, please. Right? <laughs> you're the best. He got out there and he sang. I don't know anything about singing, can't sing a lick. 
me, but I knew right away he couldn't sing either. Right? <laughs> well, when he got done, the lady, Paula Abdul, who's real nice, sugar-coated it, and she said, oh, that's the nicest outfit. Where'd you get that outfit at? She didn't even address the singing, yeah, right? Mr. Yeah, it come along to Randy, and Randy was, uh, he's a nice guy too, but he was a little, he said, well, it was a little pitchy in pitchy, a couple yeah. places, pitchy. right? And so the guy said, oh, Okay, well, I'll work on that. In other words, hey, I'm pretty good. I missed a couple notes, mm -hmm. right? It come to Simon, and Simon said, Son, is there a McDonald's in your hometown? <laughs> and he said, Yeah. He said, I want you to leave here tonight, pack your bags, go home, and apply for a job at that McDonald's because you ain't ever going to be a singer. <laughs> now, that seemed harsh, didn't it? Mm -hmm. But who was actually being honest with him? <laughs> Which one gave him the best advice? Yes, Folks, that man would be better off trying to attain a career managing a McDonald's or something, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. All right. Is it loving to keep your child from going through correction, chastisement, and tough times? Mm -hmm. no, folks, tough times build character and they right. build experience, don't they? Does the Lord allow His children to go through these things on the earth? Yeah. Now, is it God that's putting the suffering on you or is the suffering the result of not being part of the world? It's because we're not part of the world, right? Therefore, who persecutes the children of God? The world. But who will give you the strength to endure it? You know what me and you need to do? Trust Believe that. We need to trust that. If, if Look, if I can trust that He died for my sins is going to take me off of this earth one day, I can't trust that He could console me in a hard time. Well, if I can't trust that, I'm not coming under the knowledge of the Lord, am I? To acknowledge the Lord is what Israel should have done back here. Have y'all y'all read about David? Did David go through a hard life? Yes. Folks, he spent most of his life running for from Saul, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Everywhere he went, no matter how dire the situation, what would happen? God would get him through it, wouldn't he? I mean, it would look like this is it, this is the end, and God would get him through it. Over a period of time, towards the end, you know what David started to expect? Well, I wonder how God's going to get me out of it this time. What was David learning? He could trust the Lord. He was being taught God's provision, God's supply, that God is the Father and He's the child, and a loving Father takes care of their child, don't they? But what's our nature when we get in a tight spot? We're trying to do it ourselves. We first thing we do is try and come up with a plan. Yep. And any plan we come up with, what usually happens? Oh, it sure. falls short, folks. We don't we can't get it done, can we? Mm -hmm. So then in these situations, watch what Paul says, these things he was going through taught him. He said, verse nine, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. If I honestly believe God can raise the dead, and I do, I don't believe He can get me out of a, you know. And again, I'm not even talking about getting me out of it. I'm talking about giving us the grace to endure it, right? Now he says, verse 10, Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that He will yet deliver us. Then what was the Lord teaching Paul and Timothy? Yeah, he would take care of them. How in the world could you and I come on this side over here and say, yeah, God would take care of Israel physically, but He won't us. Right. That's what people are teaching today. They're teaching that, yes, God gave Israel physical things they needed, but He only gives us spiritual things. How in the world are you ever going to get to learn about the spiritual things if He don't sustain you physically? Yeah. Right. Look, if you're saved, it, I cannot be the only one. I know I'm not. Me and Wayne have talked about this many times. Even before I was ever saved, can you not look back in your life and see the Lord's providential care of you, leading you towards that day? Can't you see the Lord bringing you to that? I was talking with Chris, Chris talked about going all the way down to South America looking for God. And yet, slowly and surely, did the Lord take care of him and get him? You have got to learn to depend on the Lord, don't we? Okay, now, go over to, um, uh, let's see. Uh, we did that one. We did that one. I'm trying to make sure I cover all these verses. Go over to 2 Corinthians 4. Alright, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, Paul says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And what had Paul learned about the things he was doing? It was the Lord doing it in him, right? Now he says, verse 8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. 
how could Paul be so uh, distressed or so in such physical peril and yet not be overcome with the... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, anxiety. Anxiety. Yeah, there's the word. I mean, you don't see Paul looking for the Prozac, do you? No. Well, why not? He trusted, he trusted the Lord. Folks, the man had already been through 25 years of unbelievable things. And throughout that time, do you think he started off the first day trusting the Lord like this? No. no. Then what had the Lord been teaching him? About the Lord's nature. Will the Lord supply your need? Yes. Have y'all ever, anybody ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Y'all ever read that? If you've never read it, you ought to. You know, folks in Grace will tell you, oh, they weren't even saved. Come on now, read it. There's an old guy there in the Inquisition, I believe it was. The, they were going to cut his head off for what he believed, and then they decided to burn him at the stake. Right? Man's like 90-something years old. They get him up there at the stake, and they're going to burn him, and they say, if you'll just reject this heresy, this this whatever salvation by grace, or this, you know, if you'll accept the church's doctrine and go back to the mother church, and y'all know who the mother church is, we, we won't kill you. And y'all know what that old man said? He said, for 80, 70, 80 years, the Lord Jesus Christ has been a faithful Savior to me. I'll not deny Him now. Light the fire. Now, does anybody in here believe that man was that brave? Think about it. If you got a big lighter right now and threaten to burn me with it, I'd scream like a little girl and run out the front door, right? Mm -hmm. What in the world made that old man bold enough to stand there in the flames and say such a thing? He trusted the Lord and who was at work in him? The Lord, the Spirit of God in the believer working. And what did the Lord promise? He is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always have an all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Did that man die giving a good testimony about the Lord? Mm -hmm. Then who gave him the power to do it? Oh, right. Folks, I don't even know if the man felt what was going on. I have no idea, but I know this. No human being is that brave. How about Peter? Before the cross, <clears throat> Peter, a young girl, told Peter, aren't you a disciple of Jesus? He said, nope. He cursed That's right. He got accused the second time. He swore he wasn't. And the third time, he cursed them. He cussed them. Y'all check it out, right? Does that sound like a brave man? No. That sounds like me. After the cross, the high priest and the priesthood told him and John, don't you open your mouth again in the name of this man. And you know what Peter told them? Who am I going to obey? You or God? And he turned around and went right back into their temple and preached. What changed between here and here? <laughs> he got saved in the Spirit. And I'm not just talking about the, the supernatural pouringness. I'm talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hey, go over to uh, Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> if a person believes the teaching that you and I are not to pray to God about things in this life, that you and I have already achieved and got everything we're ever going to have in heaven, that person is never going to learn about God's providential care. They're never going to come to know. Now that person might memorize the Bible. Will that person have any practical application of knowing what God will do? Nope. Not a lick. It will be like Chris said, that guy had all that book learning. When he got there, he couldn't do nothing. Didn't know how to do a thing. Now, Philippians 2, verse 12, Paul says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed... Now, he's talking to these people called them beloved. Are they saved? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Is Paul instructing these people how they need to save themselves from hell? That's impossible, isn't it? But is he telling them that there is a salvation, a deliverance that they need to work through? Is there something inside of them that will make this possible? Next verse says it. For it is God which worketh. What tense is worketh? Present tense. Is that some future thing? Right there at that point. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Hold on a minute. Both to will and to do. What's to will mean? To give you the desire to do it. What makes a saved person want to save the Lord? The Lord. 
What makes the saved person able to do what the Lord would have them do? The Lord. What did the Lord say under this new covenant? He said, I will cause them to blah, 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 didn't He? Back here, He said, if you do it, and they never did it. Over here, He said, I'll do it in you, right? Now, I've got this person over here who gets saved. This person all of a sudden has a peace of mind come over them and it just, the peace is about their sin. The burden of their sins rolled away. It's like they're on cloud nine that day, isn't it? But you know most people never fully ever come close to understanding the peace of God on a daily basis. And I'm not claiming I have. I believe most of us fall way short of it. Is there a daily peace that comes along with salvation? Mm -hmm. Who gives you that peace? Oh, the Lord. Do y'all know that in every single book he wrote, Paul prayed for the people that they would grow in grace and peace? Well, if you're going to grow in it, what's that mean? It's an increase, right? If you're going to increase in grace and peace, who's going to have to give the increase? The Lord. Then how are you going to, what do you, do you think God would have you and I learn every day? About Him supplying us with the ability to do these things, okay? Go over to, um, go to Isaiah. I've got to use this one because it's Wayne's favorite. Go to Isaiah 26. Alright, I had a, uh, I had a family member. It was my granny. My granny had a stroke. And... They had her in the hospital, and they got the, the stroke under control there, and she got back, come back conscious, and she was talking and whatnot, and she made it very clear that she was not to be kept alive on any machine or anything like that. She made that clear for years, and she wasn't just saying it to sound good, she meant it. When it's my time to go, you just let me go, right? She wasn't fretting, she was late. we got to talk to her, and later that day, the bleeding took over, and she didn't talk anymore. Well, I had another family member who come in, and her all her children were together, and they were talking about the fact that, look, now Mama Granny didn't want to be put on these machines and all, we're not going to do that, and I had one family member that was insistent that, yes, we put her on those machines. And I remember listening to the conversation as they come back out of the room and listening to them, and this person kept saying this, and something occurred to me about this person. They were terrified of death. And he even made the statement, he said, well, if that's ever me, I want y'all to do whatever you've got to do to keep me alive until the very last breath. I want you to know I want to stay alive. Why was that person of that opinion? If you don't know anything about say he's not saved. So in that person's mind, what's it all about? This life. Right? This life and whatever comes in this life. Does this life go beyond? The, no. So then this person wanted to stay alive because this person had no hope and had zero peace about their situation. My granny didn't care. She was ready to die. What's the difference? She had peace. My granny had peace because my granny believed in the Lord. She trusted the Lord. Now, as my granny was going to was about to pass away and go, was my granny looking at it like, well, here comes the end of the line? No. My granny's looking at it like I'm about to meet the Lord and begin a new life, eternal life, right? But for the person that doesn't have that hope, that person has nothing but fear every day. When I was little, we used to make a Christmas uh, calendar and we'd count down the days to Christmas. You think about somebody that's living in this world. All, I mean, just living it up in this world and has no concern about Jesus Christ or anything else. Every day of their life, in the back of their mind, they're marking off those days because it's coming to an end, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Does that person have any hope beyond mm -hmm. the grave? No. Nope. 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 Now watch what Isaiah says. Verse, uh, chapter 26, mm -hmm. verse 3, he says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Isn't that a great verse? Mm -hmm. Can God keep a person in perfect peace? Yes. Imagine Paul. He was on that boat. I love reading that account in Acts 27. They're, they're on that boat and they're, they're going under. I mean, it's a hurricane, right? And they're throwing stuff over. They ain't eight and I can't tell you how many days. And they're just, they're, they're fretting and they're just this and that. And what's Paul doing? Paul's peaceful. That you don't read a word about Paul doing anything. It says finally at one point, Paul stood up and told them, look fellas, it's all going to be alright. 
angel of the Lord appeared to me tonight and said, the Lord's going to take care of us. I said, not anybody on this ship will get hurt. All you got to do is remain on the ship. Now, why was Paul so calm and those men were so fretful? He believed, he had hope, he trusted the Lord, and his mind was stayed on the Lord. Okay? How about as Paul's in prison? Have you if you ever think about Paul's life from the day he got saved, it's horrible, wasn't it, physically? Do you know when it looks to me like his life was the best quality physically? When he was in prison. When he got to Rome in prison. Think about it. As he's out here, he said he's in perils and under the water and naked and, and starving and hungry and snake bit. snake bit and killing and stoning, right? When he gets to prison in Rome, it says they let him abide in his own house and receive all that came unto him. The man gets in prison and his life's better than it's been before, isn't it? Now, as Paul's sitting in prison, if I was in prison, I'd be writing the governor and I'd be trying to get a lawyer and I'd be scared and worried and all that. What's Paul doing? He's writing letters for the Lord. Paul's sitting in this preacher here, worried about this church there. What was Paul's mind on? The Lord. Then was Paul fretting about his current condition? No. Because his mind was on the Lord. So what did Paul have? Peace. That's a daily peace that you and I can have, isn't it? Mm. Now, I, I'm afraid we just don't, we don't do that. We don't scratch the surface of that kind of peace. But it's ours to have. The Lord said it. If the Lord said it and He doesn't do it, then the Lord lied, right? Mm -hmm. Go to Philippians uh, 4, 7. Didn't, didn't, didn't you use, you told me a long time ago, you used that verse to the Lord. The Lord, you said, I'm going to trust in you. Take care of me. And you ain't never looked back. If He said, now if somebody would say, yeah, but that verse is in the Old Testament. Folks, show me what's dispensational about that verse. Yeah. He didn't say, oh Israel, and He said, mm, He's going to give peace to the one... You know how I know that verse is true? Because I've experienced it. You know, he said that we can pray, and he didn't even say you'd necessarily get the answer for your prayer. He said the answer a lot of times would be what? Peace. Peace about the thing. Watch what he says in Philippians 4, verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Now that doesn't mean don't be cautious. It means don't be fretful. Don't be nervous, okay? Be careful for nothing, but in everything. Now what does everything mean? Is everything. There any, okay. Is there anything excluded from everything? No. Nope. So then would it include daily meals? Would it include a roof over your head? Would it include everything or anything we might possibly need? Okay. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Now, prayer is petition, right? What's supplication? Supply. And so then, are we to pray to the Lord for our supply? Do you think it's just spiritual supply? Folks, we're physical creatures, aren't we? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Did he say only your spiritual requests? No, folks. How in the world can you imagine a father giving birth, having a, having a child, his wife has the child, and the father says to the child, okay, see you when you're 21. Don't bother me till you're 21. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to supply what you need. I'm not going to teach you. I'm not going to spank you when you need it. I'm not going to raise you. I'm hands off. I know that happens a lot today, but the point is, would a loving father do that? You know what these folks in grace are teaching a lot of times is that very thing. They're teaching that you get saved and yet God ain't at work in this world. God's setting up on high. He's already done everything He's going to do. Then why in the world would He tell Paul to tell us to pray? I mean, really. Now He says next verse. When you pray, verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Is that something that just happened at salvation or is that a supply thing? It's a continuous thing. If you and I never experience that, what are you and I going to know about it? Then what could I possibly tell someone? And how could I come? You're in turmoil and I come and I want to talk to you about your turmoil. What could I tell you about it if I ain't never been comforted by the Lord? Well, if I never open my mouth or never put myself in a situation to suffer anything for His name and I've never under that particular thing because I'd rather keep my mouth shut, then guess what? I won't know anything to tell you. 
I won't have a thing in the world to tell you to do you a lick of good because I never had to be comforted of the Lord in that situation because I chose to avoid that situation. Does that make sense? Okay, now he says, verse 8, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. The things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Does that sound like a God that's on vacation somewhere? No. Folks, you know, do people not believe that God Almighty said through His Spirit He would take up residence in us? Why do y'all suppose He wanted to do that? It, folks, God is in the saved person. What does God want to do with that saved person? Come unto the knowledge of God. It's not just this come unto the knowledge of what the Bible said. The guy said, you know, he's learned this and wrote this. Folks, that ain't... Look... We have been led to believe that at the judgment seat of Christ, it's all going to be about doctrine. Okay? I used to think that. I was taught this, and it made sense. I said, okay, then it's going to be the one that has the best doctrine. Right? Folks, that's a matter of pride. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pure pride. I'm telling y'all, I'm absolutely certain that when we get at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a ton of people there who are going to be far outranking me, and they ain't going to know much about doctrine at all. But with their whole heart, they learn to trust the Lord through the things they went through. I bet we're going to meet people that came through that situation in Europe that with all their heart learn to trust the Lord. We're going to meet people who with all their heart every day, as much as anybody ever has, have wanted to serve the Lord. You know, we live in this last time, and I personally believe those chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation is, is a stage of things. But everybody remembers the lukewarm bunch? They weren't hot, they weren't cold. Look, I know people that lived in the 1800s in history that you can read about, and they might not have had much doctrine, and they didn't have much school, and a lot of them couldn't even read and write, but they woke up every day, thanked the Lord, and asked the Lord to lead them, and they, they, they petitioned the Lord. They learned to trust the Lord. It's not about doctrine from the book. Now, do we need to study doctrine? Mm -hmm. Yes. But studying doctrine and achieving the understanding of doctrine is not the application of it. The application of learning to trust the Lord is learning to know who He is by experience. Now, I know the Word of God is part of that, but that's not all of it. There are people today that teach something along these lines that I could get saved and go hide in a cave for the rest of my life and learn the Word of God perfectly, and at the judgment seat, I'll reign over all. What am I going to know about the Lord if that's what I do? If I'm in a cave, what am I going to learn about the Lord delivering me from abuse and you need to learn anything about Him? Are you? Okay, now let's go on to another one. Uh, go to uh, Romans 8. When y'all get a chance, y'all just look up the word peace and go look at every time it's in the New Testament. Okay? Just read the verses and see what it says. Jesus Christ said to the apostles in John 14 and 16 that He, peace I'll give you, right? My peace I leave you. He said in the world you're going to have turmoil and trouble. Right? But who's going to deliver you through that world? The Lord. The, Lord. the picture's right here. Did the Lord bring Israel into that wilderness? Mm -hmm. Look, that wilderness is a picture of the saved person in the world today. Yeah. Right? What, how did God bring them out over here? What did they have? Yeah. Well, they, He fed them. But they had a cloud by day. And fire by night. What do y'all reckon that pillar leading them was a type of? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Paul said over here, if you be led by the Spirit. Does that mean we need to look around for a cloud? No. How does the Spirit lead one? Inside, folks, by faith. Haven't you ever felt an urging about something from the Lord? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're saved, I know you have. If you're saved, you felt the urging of the Lord convicting you about your sin, didn't you? Yeah. Now, this is not some uh, uh, charismatic thing. I'm not talking about the Lord said to me, no. I don't mean that at all. Have you ever had somebody, maybe it's just a family member or something, and you're there with them and you've just got an urge that you cannot describe. There's something in you creating a desire to talk to this person about the Lord. Yeah. Well, who do you think's doing that? Oh. He just said he will will and do. 
So then that urging is urging me. If I suppress that urge, what have I done? I've just quenched the spirit at him. But if I act on that urge, if he's creating the desire in me, and he is, guess who also will do it? He will. Then I don't need to think up witty stories, and I need to just quote the Word of God to him, don't I? What's doing the work? Lord. God, the Lord is. Okay, we learn to trust the Lord like this. All right, in Romans 8, verse 5, he says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, that means your mind on the flesh, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, is, present tense, right? We started out with the wages of sin is death. Daily, the lost person has only death. All their works are all going to pass away. It's nothing but death and failure, right? But daily, the saved person ought to have eternal life, shouldn't they? Uh, again, I talk about my granny laying there in that bed. And in that bed, there in Biloxi, Mississippi, she laid there. She had hope. She was looking forward to something else. Mm -hmm. All right? If the person over here has their mind on fleshly things, and this doesn't mean they're lost, although it could, could be. This could be a saved person whose mind is on carnal things. In other words, if I think that that Hyundai in the driveway is my reward from God, Right? Am I spiritually minded or carnally minded? Oh. What's going to happen to that Hyundai? It's going to melt with fervent heat, isn't it? Then what my mind is on, carnal things, what happens to them? They die and go away. No matter what it is that my mind's set on, if it's earthly, what does it come to? It comes to nothing, right? But what if I've got my mind on spiritual things? Now that produces something, doesn't it? Okay, so he says again, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, can that be in the midst of turmoil? Mm -hmm. yeah. Life and peace in the midst of turmoil? Yeah. He says, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can, indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. All right, if I uh, want to go around setting my sights on things on the earth, one day the earth's going to melt and those things will be gone, won't they? Okay. <clears throat> then would it be better for me to focus on physical things that are going to melt and go away or to focus on learning to trust the Lord? Learning to to trust the Lord's supply, learning to know the Lord as a Father, learning to know the Lord who will guide us and protect us. Okay, go on over to, uh, uh, let's see, Romans 3. All right, how does this peace begin? What's the first step in having the peace of God? Saved. 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 you got to be saved. Does the unsaved person have any type of peace of God? No. Okay. Matter of fact, I, there have been a bunch of times when I've been in a Bible study and you preach the gospel, you can tell there's someone under conviction. You can tell they're bothered. They're under, and there's usually somebody that will come along and want to smooth it over. I hear them, I'll have a Bible study and somebody be under conviction and hey, there's one guy in particular, Lexi Tate, he always does this. Somebody's under conviction and when I get done, I think, boy, I hope they're in absolute misery and turmoil until the Lord saves them. Yeah. I mean, I hope this thing is just misery on them to keep their mind on it so they'll get saved, right? As soon as class is over, this guy will come on and say, oh no, it's okay, you know, hey, could try and consult him. He means well. Mm -hmm. You know what he needs to do? Shut up. And he shut up and leave it alone. Right. Okay. Now, the lost world doesn't know about this peace. So in Romans 3, Paul says, verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. Okay. Verse 12, They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Verse 15, Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way. Now watch verse 17. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. What does it mean the way of peace they have not known? They never trusted the Lord. They're not saved. Okay, the way of peace. Go on over to uh, chapter 10. Chapter 10 verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? 
How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful of the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Then where does the peace come from? The way of peace. It's the gospel. Can a person ever begin to have the peace of God without salvation? So then it starts there, doesn't it? Okay, one more verse I want to do if y'all want go to Mark 9. This is one of my favorite passages right here. Mark 9. <clears throat> to save time, we're out of time. You can read it. It starts in verse 14. But it's uh, Jesus Christ is going to heal. Man's trying to, trying to get uh, his son healed, right? And uh, come down to... Uh, uh, verse 19. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Remember the apostles couldn't heal the kid? Mm -hmm. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. He asked of his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? He said of a child. Oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and in the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You know, as a saved person, there ain't nothing wrong with that prayer. Folks, I believe for salvation, but I pray daily that the Lord would edify us and help our unbelief in daily things. We say we believe the Lord uh, can do all these fabulous things, but then we get in these simple little situations in life and we won't trust Him. Okay? I, I pray that the Lord help our unbelief. Just like a little child, does a little child grow up? You know, when I was this tall, I thought my dad was an idiot, right? But now today I look back and he gets smarter every day. The things that I was told were abuse, now I look back and I'm thankful he did it, right? What's happened? Growing in knowledge, right? To grow in the knowledge of the Lord, to come unto the knowledge of the truth, is the truth of what God is to His people, what God is to all of creation, is to come unto the a full and complete understanding of God's perfect and righteous nature. And I'm afraid that me and you don't even come close. We don't even scratch the surface on trusting the Lord daily. Hey, that'd be a great prayer for us to pray. Or Lord, hey, look, I want to do this. I want Help me with it, Lord, because if it's going to get done, you're going to have to do it in me because I ain't got it. I pray you will it in me and then do it in me, Lord.